Welcome to the Middle East Institute's webinar, What Are Pakistan's Aims in Afghanistan? I'm Marvin Weinbaum and I direct MAI's Afghanistan and Pakistan's Studies Program. We're joined as hosts for today's panel discussion by Indus. Indus is a Washington DC nonprofit think tank and research organization dedicated to strengthening US Pakistan relations and furthering democratic ideals and fostering youth political leadership development in Pakistan. There are many, plainly many views about Pakistan's inv involvement in Afghanistan. And they range widely from contending that Pakistan is bent on destabilizing its Western neighbor and making it into a vassal state to a Pakistan whose national interest lies in cooperating on a peaceful outcome in an Afghanistan that can be made stable, united, and prosperous. There's little debate, however, that the two countries' concerns and their economic well-being are closely intertwined. Arguably, no country has more of a stake in Afghanistan's future than Pakistan. And that Afghanistan's future hinges more on its relationship with Pakistan than with any other country. It can also be said that their relationship has direct bearing on the political stability and development potential of the region. And that the success of US and international efforts to stem global terrorism and nuclear proliferation are an issue. To help us sort through the varying interpretations of Pakistan's aims in Afghanistan and to weigh the significance of their relationship, we have a distinguished panel. Medea Abzal is the David M. Rubenstein Fellow, Center for Middle East Policy at the Brookings Institution. Asad Durrani, former chief of Pakistan's military intelligence and inner service intelligence, ISI, and form, is also former ambassador to Germany and Saudi Arabia. Afasiyab Hatak is a former member of Pakistan Senate, well known as a Pashtun political uh, uh, and human rights activist and a keen analyst of international and glo particularly global affairs. Jawed Lodin is the former deputy foreign minister of Afghanistan. It was during the regime of uh, Hamid Karzai was at one point chief of staff and is today the president of the Heart of Asia Society. I'm going to be posing a series of questions to members of the panel. There'll be an opportunity later in the program for your questions, those who are with us today, to submit those questions, which can be submitted at any time during the course of the panel discussion. Please use Zoom's Q&A feature, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. For those who are with us by phone or watching the panel on live stream, you can ask a question by emailing events at nei.edu. If you have any technical issues, please use the same email, events at nei.edu. So let's begin. A term which has been used so regularly to describe what Pakistan's interests are in Afghanistan is strategic depth. So um, let me ask the panel, how relevant currently, how valid is that concept of strategic depth in our understanding Pakistan's views of Afghanistan? So who'd like to start us off? Asad. Please. 
I volunteered because I know I am the target of that particular question. I have been for the last so many years because one has not been able to convey to the people what is it that that one means by state of care. And so, since you have read my book, I have argued somewhere that if one looks at these things very objectively, it's actually Pakistan that provides strategic depth to Afghanistan. Whenever it gets invaded, the refugees come by the millions, the trade centers are here, the hospitals are here. Once upon a time, this was the only window. But that is, as I said, as a last resort, I give this argument. But actually, what is it that one understands by strategic depth? That is the problem. Is it the buffer of the old time, where you thought that there was a cushion between you and the Soviet Union, or the British Empire and the Soviet Union? In our case, it turned out that an independent Afghanistan, capable of taking its decisions, was so hugely beneficial to us that both in our wars in 65 and 71, it looked after our western borders while we removed every bit of security force on the eastern. So that was the advantage of having a good Afghanistan that can take its own decisions, that knows the value of Pakistan, that knows that Pakistan has to be, remain, has to be kept viable, that it has a bigger threat from India, and that it does not want a common border with India. The Indians also do not want a common border with, uh, with Afghanistan. I can quote so many people, they are fine experts. So if that comes down to a good flank protection, I hate to call it a friendly neighborhood because then people under misunderstand the term strategic there. So let me say it's a good secure border that one is looking for. Certainly not what people generally understand that you want to have a Kabul regime under your thumb, or you want to have, you know, another province like Afghanistan. I think people here would be absolutely foolish if they would think that they can dictate things to an, to Afghans, especially a country like Afghanistan. Leave aside the factions. Okay. Th thank you. Thank you, Asad. Uh, okay. who'd, who'd like to respond? Uh, Asad, As As please. Yes, uh, you see, Park of Han relations uh, had a, a long history, but the strategic thing started after 1978 or 79 and 80. I think uh, uh, it is a qualitatively new policy that Pakistan adapted after uh, the Soviet influence in Afghanistan and ultimately induction of Soviet forces. Uh, so it was basically Pakistan army which uh, uh, devised this policy under Ziaul Haq, Akhtar Abdurrahman, and others. Uh, you see, Mr. Bhutto uh, has referred to this uh, prospects of this policy in 1979 in his last book, which he wrote in his death cell in Rawalpindi before getting executed. He, he uh, likens Pakistan army to Prussian army during the Napoleonic Wars, a big army which was not affordable. So, so the country sort of expanded under Bismarck and created uh, Germany. Uh, uh, there were other options like uh, uh, reducing the strength of the army uh, and keeping the status quo and letting the country crumble under the burden of a big army. Bhutto says that we, we uh, can't really have this expansion. So he thinks he, we will have uh, this uh, state collapse under the burden of a big army. This he writes in his last book. But you see, the generals went for the first option, expansion. And strategic depth is an euphemism for this. It's not just military. You see, they tempered with Afghan uh, national identity. They, this uh, Afghan Muslim identity was tempered with, and they exaggerated this Muslim part, uh, not for the love of Islam, but to weaken the Afghan part. A and you see, Mujahideen failed to deliver. Then uh, Taliban uh, was a spontaneous movement initially in Kandahar, but then Pakistani security agencies uh, pounced on it, jumped on it, and they adopted it as instrument of strategic depth. So Taliban is a devolution squad. Let loose on Afghanistan as state, as a uh, nation. You see, Taliban, when they entered Kabul in 1996, what were the first six or seven things that they did? They banned Afghan national flag. They uh, banned Afghan national anthem. 
they renamed Radio Kabul as Vice of Sharia. Radio Islamabad is not Vice of Sharia. Radio Tehran is not Vice of Sharia. But Radio Kabul was, became Vice of Sharia. They banned Nowruz, the New Year's Day. They banned Jirga, the Pashtun uh, uh, social institution. They, you see, killed Dr. Najibullah. They, they demolished uh, Buddha's statue. Everything that stood of Af Afghaniyat or Afghanhood was attacked. It was not a coincidence. They were programmed for it. So this policy continues. Even today, there are thousands of Pakistanis fighting inside Afghanistan. This Hillman fighting recently, dozens of dead bodies have come to Pakistan. Unfortunately, our media is not uh, allowed to, and, and uh, unfortunately, the, the new American policy is also not sensitive to these things. So it, it, it's really a fully war in Afghanistan, fought with Pakistan army support by Taliban. And Taliban is, of course, an instrument of uh, this policy. Uh, and I don't think there is any change in this policy to this day. OK, thank you. Uh, Jawed, uh, yes, please. Um, well, neighbors can and should provide strategic debt to each other. Um, but I think that's, um, that, that's far from the, 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 the definition that um, uh, our friend uh, General Saeb Asadurani has of the strategic debt um, uh, concept. Um, sadly, that strategic debt that in an ideal world uh, we could have provided um, uh, to Pakistan, and in fact, the strategic debt that Pakistan is now providing to the Taliban, uh, uh, for example, this in an ideal world, this would have been different. This would have been uh, this would have been a strategic debt anchored in economic prosperity and people-to-people -people relationship and, and friendly state-to-state -state relationship and also a recognition of, of the fact that people may have different um, expectations from, from a relationship. Uh, sadly, in this context, uh, this has been a, a completely one-sided policy and implemented through uh, instruments of, of deception and, and, and aggression. Uh, and and that's, that's far from the, the notion of strategic debt that you have in, in the normal world, which is based on mutual consensus, which is based on, on, on true respect uh, uh, for, uh, for each other. Um, we have, I mean, the, 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 the background to this, I'm not going to get into the, uh, the, the, the historic background because I think uh, Khatak said, uh, explained it very well. Um, in the past 20 years, one of the things that we tried here in Afghanistan was to see if we could um, um, engage with, with, with our friends in Pakistan and come up with a different definition of, of this, this loaded term in, in our relationship in the, 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 the term of strategic depth, we, we tried to see if we could, um, we could replace the idea of, of a secure, uh, of, of the obsession with borders, uh, the obsession with, our, with, with foreign relations, the, the obsession with certain countries in the region, um, um, and, and the obsession with control. I think the fundamental problem with this notion of strategic depth that we have seen from Pakistan is, the, is that it's, it's actually uh, not this consensual uh, friendly relationship that can serve as strategic depth in, in, in time of, of need, but this has been really more about hegemonic control rather than, than uh, strategic depth anchored in and mutually beneficial relationships. We tried to see if we can redefine that, um, uh, but sadly, uh, you know, there's been a failure of that uh, by right now. Uh, I don't see, uh, there is now a lot of talk about this notion of change in Pakistan. Is there a change in Pakistan? And a lot of people have talked about that over the years with different civilian governments uh, coming into power in Pakistan and different um, sort of iterations of the military strategy and uh, with regard to Afghanistan, we have all uh, expected to see some, some change. Um, but I, I think this whole notion of, uh, of uh, strategic depth 
is so embedded in, in I think, in the, in, in the mindset of the military establishment in Pakistan that, that, that it hasn't shifted. I think the, um, one of the, the manifestations of this policy in Pakistan was, was the fact that, you know, like, like I said, like you would do in a normal situation, if we, you expect a, another a neighbor to be your strategic depth in, time of, in times of need, you would, you would invest in strengthening them. Uh, but I think Pakistan has consistently invested in state failure in Afghanistan. And the reason I think that it hasn't changed is because today we see the same thing. I think I, I think generally uh, the policy right now is is one that uh, of a continued investment in state failure. The peace process that's taking place right now, uh, even though as an Afghan, uh, you know, sitting here in Kabul and facing relentless violence on a daily basis, we are pinning a lot of hopes um, on that. We're going to, uh, we're going to come to the peace process in just a moment. If uh, uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Madiha. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I think, um, first of all, uh, thank you for getting this great uh, group of varied perspectives together, Marvin. Um, and I'm glad I'm batting last uh, in this round because I get to hear um, sort of the varied perspectives uh, from, from the region. Um, so as Jawed noted, uh, the, the term to strategic depth is very, very loaded. And you can see the mistrust, the distrust from both sides. Um, so, and it means different things to, to different people as we've seen. What does strategic depth mean to, to me sitting from, from my perch? Um, it is essentially uh, born um, out of a worry, uh, a paranoia some might say in Pakistan, um, which uh, faces India on its Eastern border that it wants to ensure influence or a friendly government on its Western border in Afghanistan. So that is very simply what it, what it means to me. And uh, the Pakistani government now, Imran Khan's government has sort of uh, talked about it directly and said, look, this concept is not relevant anymore. We have moved past it, has it or not. So we can, we can um, uh, I, I'll just point very quickly to three things that um, may give us some indication as to whether it's moved beyond it or not. And, and, and before that, you know, I think the understanding that people may get from this definition of strategic depth is that Pakistan wants a government more like the Taliban and less like the current Kabul government so, or some kind of configuration that weighs the Taliban quite heavily um, in, in Kabul because they people consider uh, that uh, Taliban would be more friendly to, to Pakistan than the current Kabul government. So that's sort of the conception. That's not what I'm saying. Um, I think the concept of strategic depth has been ma made less relevant in Pakistan in the last few years. And one is because of reality. Uh, and that reality is the recognition of Pakistan's centrality to Afghanistan and to the Afghan peace process, you know, that's been given that position that's been given to it by the Trump administration and by uh, Zalmay Khalilzad. And for all purposes, India uh, has really not been a central player in this Afghan peace process. That allays Pakistan's fears to a, to a great deal. Uh, and so the reality is, look, Pakistan is the third country on the table other than Afghanistan and, and the U.S. in, in Afghanistan. Um, so, so that's sort of my first point. The second point is that Pakistan has been establishing a relationship with um, multiple actors in, in Afghanistan, right? So, uh, and that includes the Kabul government. Um, you know, there have been multiple visits uh, with uh, 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 Ghani and uh, Dr. Abdullah Abdullah was recently in Pakistan and had a great visit uh, there in Islamabad um, just a few weeks ago. And I think the third point is that the relationship with the Taliban that Pakistan has with the Afghan Taliban is not as seamless as some people might portray. Um, and I'm sure we're going to get into this in much more detail, but the two things that I'll just point to very quickly is the question of terrorism and the Afghan Taliban's relationship with the Pakistan Taliban, which attacks Pakistan directly, and Pakistan has worries about that. And then the second thing, again, which I'm sure we'll get to um, uh, in, in that not seamless relationship, 
is that an Islamic Emirate is not ideal for Pakistan on its Western border because there will be spillover effects that are undesirable in terms of fundamentalism and militancy, et cetera, uh, into Pakistan. You know, uh, India was always part of this equation as well. And I guess you could argue that once there was nuclear parity of sorts, that the idea that you needed someplace physically to retire to it lost its meaning. Uh, the uh, uh, really the deterrent effect here would be a nuclear one and not based on geography. But Medea has, has brought up this business of, of what kind of government would uh, Pakistan prefer to see in Afghanistan. She's given some thoughts about that. Does anybody want to add to that? What would what would best serve uh, Pakistan at this present time? Yes, Joey. I think it's really um, the, the 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 question is, um, is is more about India. I think the Pakistan Pakistani relationship with India, and as long as that is the way it is, um, Pakistan's view of, um, of or, or or Pakistan's preference of, uh, of a government in Kabul would really be determined by its by by that government's relationship with India, sadly. Uh, I, 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 I echo what, um, what Madiha just said uh, about the fact that, a, a, you know, this, despite all the, the, the historic relationship with Taliban, it's inconceivable that, that the restoration of the Islamic Emirate would be seen as ideal um, by any sensible Pakistani um, statesman. Um, or, or stateswoman. The, um, so, uh, so I think it's not really the type of government in Kabul that, uh, that, would, um, th that would matter. Uh, for pa from Pakistan's point of view, any government, as long as it is, um, you know, I think for lack of a better word, uh, maybe subservient in, in terms of its relationship uh, with with India and in the regional um, strategic equation, that that would be the desirable government. Okay. Uh, anyone else want to contrast on this? Uh, if not, let me let me. Okay, uh, I said please go ahead. I said go ahead. Yeah, you see, as we continue as we proceed with the discussion. There are so many things that will start falling in place. What is it that Pakistan wants in Afghanistan? After all, Afghanistan was always a matter of a grand bargain between various factions. That is how it was created, 1747. And if you look at the, you know, the configuration of Afghanistan, the type of uh, divisions that take place that, that are there, all types of geographical, tribal, ethnic, cultural, and so on and so forth. It is very logical that only that government will be stable that has the support of all major factions. And that is why Pakistan's main interest there is to have a government which has the support of all the factions that remains stable and that in turn will look after the interests of Afghanistan, of Pakistan more than anything else. Because as I said, once it was there, they did look after our interests and in, by implication their own interests. So a stable, a consensus government, in my days you used to call it about a, you know, the, the, the grand consensus between the various factions, a broad-based government, that only serves the purpose of Afghanistan and Pakistan. Let me just quickly say, India's role has been exaggerated. India never played that type of a role in our calculations that people believe it has. Some people make it out to rationalize a particular argument. Sometimes even in Pakistan, because if they don't want to do certain things, they say, well, major interest is um, because of the threat from the East. That is how the whole thing gets convoluted. Otherwise, just a sta simple, straightforward, stable Afghanistan master of its own destiny, can take its own decision, that was going to serve everyone's purpose. This friendly government thing was never used by the people who dealt with Afghanistan, because 
Today there will be one government and tomorrow there will be another government. Does that mean that Pakistan is going to go and you know go on war against any government that is not friendly in that sense? My argument is every stable government there will be friendly because it looks after its own interests. Okay, Th thank you, sir. Uh, what's the nature of Pakistan's relationship with the Taliban? And how much influence does it exercise over the, the insurgency's political wing? And in the same context, uh, how important today uh, is, are the remaining safe havens of the Taliban in Pakistan? Uh, you see, uh, actions speak louder than words. You see, uh, Pakistani leaders, uh, military leaders have uh, remained in denial. Uh, General Musharraf talked of enlightened moderation, but Taliban grew and grew and grew. General Rahil Sharif talked of a grand operation against terrorism, national action plan came into being. I was in parliament, I was part of this national action plan debate. But it was 20 points, not a single point was implemented. General Bajwa talked of Raddul Fasad, I mean, doing away with tumult, doing away with this uh, whole uh, jihadi thing, but the, it has grown. You see, in 1889, Soviet forces have withdrawn. Pakistan has not built any road into Afghanistan, no railway line, no, no geoeconomic, it's geostrategic. There are jeepable roads because Taliban can drive their uh, motorcycles. Uh, so Pakistan doesn't need to build railway lines, the uh, trade routes, uh, e e even customs, even other things. You see, so so the, the policy unfortunately has been uh, Taliban. You see, when, when you talk of Taliban, they, it was a spontaneous movement in Kandahar in 1994, but it was immediately adopted by Pakistani security services. And after that, it has been a sort of very, very uh, close under the cool influence of uh, Pakistani establishment. I, 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 I think those who deny this will really be uh, sort of joking with the reality be, 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 because we, we know uh, in great details, I mean, as to how things work. Of course, Pakistani foreign office doesn't have much influence on Taliban. They just can uh, sort of uh, uh, refuse a, a, everything to our ambassadors. But, but when it comes to the real handlers, I mean, we, I know because, because the real handlers have been uh, running their thing. I mean, uh, and you see this Al-Qaeda and other things, these were accessories of Project Taliban. You see, uh, Al-Qaeda came very handy because somebody would uh, ask who is giving uh, training them. They would say, it's Al-Qaeda. Who is giving them arms? and money, it's Al-Qaeda. Who is giving them ideological motivation? It's Al-Qaeda. So you see, so, so if you re remember in late 1990s when the, when the uh, hijackers brought an Indian uh, aeroplane, that was a practical demonstration of uh, the strategic depth. So it, it works, it works. A and so, so, so you see the Taliban is basically uh, uh, an instrument and, and you see the, their emirate in Quetta. For the last many decades, if, if, if really Pakistan was interested in Durand line, how could an Afghan parallel government been sitting in Pakistan for decades? Even today, as we are talking, I mean, they, they say uh, Taliban's control 60 or 70 percent of Afghanistan, but their emirate is sitting in Pakistan. And so, so and, and unfortunately, this is a very grim reality. And but I, I, I have hope. Uh, if we, yeah, I, I'm not going to, I'm going to stop here, but. I, I, I can talk of hope in Pakistan and that in my next question, yeah. Yeah, well, my question really, and, uh, and I'll turn to Abadiya, uh, is I, th I don't think anybody doubts this influence, but is Pakistan, it's important for the current situation, is Pakistan a position to dictate to the top? Does it have that kind of influence which extends so that it can actually tell the, uh, we'll get to the negotiations in a moment, but can it actually determine what Pakistan, what uh, what the Taliban's position will be? So please, uh, Madia. Um, no, it cannot. It's not in a position to dictate, but it ha exercises 
perhaps more influence than any other actor, right? So, um, and that has been, we can deduce that. We don't need to uh, actually do anything more than observe the actions of, um, you know, the American government uh, and, and Zalmay Khalilza, the negotiating team from the, the US side uh, in uh, the number of visits that have been made to Islamabad and Rawalpindi over the last, um, two years. Uh, and even at, you know, at any point at which the, both the, um, the U.S. Taliban peace process was, um, you know, um, sort of hitting hurdles and at any point during which the Taliban, sort of the intra-Afghan uh, peace process, the Taliban Kabul peace process is hitting hurdles, um, the, the travel uh, has been to Islamabad and Rawalpindi. So the, the assumption there is that the Pakistani state can exercise control uh, over it more than any other actor, but because the Taliban is a sovereign, in some sense, sovereign political identi uh, entity, it is not complete control. That's that's what I would I would say, and that's you know from observation uh, uh, over the last couple of years. Um, I think the one thing when we talk about safe havens, it's important to note, you know, we, 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 we in Washington talk about um, safe havens that th Pakistan has um, for the Taliban. And I think one thing that we are missing in the narrative, which is important to note, is that, you know, with the United States making a deal with the Taliban uh, and, and sort of giving it a le legitimacy with um, Trump calling the Taliban leader, um, many Pakistanis are wondering wh why it is that Pakistan's influence over the Taliban, which has been so instrumental here uh, in the Afghan peace process, is also the thing that Washington maligns about Pakistan, right? So that is something that we have an answer to in Washington, but many Pakistanis don't understand why Pakistan is still being maligned for its relationship with the group. So I think that's something that would be useful to address. I also have a quick point to make on the um, the government in uh, what kind of regime Pakistan wants in uh, in Kabul. If if Marvin, if we have a minute, um, so so just very quickly, I think um, you know a couple of things have been said about this. I don't think Pakistan necessarily wants just only a government friendly to it. Um, you know, it certainly wants a stable government, and it wants a stable government because it realizes. I think Pakistan is more and more realizing that its ascendance has to be born out of now economic ascendance rather than kind of a geostrategic posture. And so it needs a good economic relationship with Kabul. And for that, it needs a stable Kabul. But still, I think Pakistan is very, uh, you know, Pakistan cannot deny that it would far prefer a government that is friendlier to Islamabad than it is to New Delhi in Kabul. And I think that's pretty simple. So that, I think, is the defining um, sort of feature of what Pakistan wants. Thank you. I'm going to deny. I'm yeah. going to deny that. I don't think that one is looking for a government which is friendlier. One is only looking for a government that is stable, and it will determine what type of a relationship it will have with Pakistan, with Iran, with India, for the rest of the world. That's the only practical way of doing it. But the more important point is, people keep wondering. Why do we support the groups like Taliban or the Mujahideen? For the simple reason that they resist foreign occupation. We've done that all the time. Because when the foreign troops are there, the civil war is on, some people will resist the foreigners, the debris comes of Pakistan. At the same time, the most important role that Pakistan has laid for itself is we must keep leverage not only with the others, but also with the resistance, so that we can bring them to table. That is the only commitment that one ever made. And we did that twice in Doha before, twice in Mari, and now in the PO group. We can only bring them, bring the horse to water. We cannot make them drink. Now that is essentially the crux of Pakistan's policy in Afghanistan. Thank you. Joey. Um, yeah. Um... Marvin, I think I think that the term I have problem with the term dictate because I don't I think that kind of misses the point um, here. I mean, in today's world, nobody uh, dictates any anybody really within within strong governments. They they hardly can dictate their own entities, let alone 
um, an insurgency in another uh, in in a different country. Um, but, so I think the, the the right question to ask, which would really get to the reality of the situation, is is if Pakistan in a position to to direct or to influence Taliban towards a certain outcome, and I think that's that's undisputably the case. Um, First of all, um, I mean, other than the historic uh, relationship that the country has had with... with well, let uh, me just stop you for a moment. Would you include in that, even if it runs seemingly against uh, the Taliban's core values? Um, I, I think you, I, again, um, um, no, I think you're right. Uh, but, the, but what are Taliban core values? They, other than a religious... Um, uh, 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 context of, uh, as a religious group, and that obviously, um, as was said earlier by one of the presenters, is not something that Pakistan has problem with, because obviously Pakistan's own association with, with, um, with jihad and, and Islam as the foundation of, of state is, is, is also um, a, a reality. So I don't think they have the problem with, uh, with entities that, that espouse Islamic um, uh, values uh, as the basis of their action. They, but I think here we are talking about, about political outcomes. Political outcomes, the Taliban um, has for many years now been the only strategic asset that Pakistan has invested in. Uh, Taliban have the extent of Taliban's own um, presence, connections in Pakistan really gives the gives Pakistan the kind of instruments that 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 that, that, that Pakistan, um, and especially because they know it, they have, they go back many many years. They know how to manipulate and use those those assets and those relationships. They can really, if they want to, they can dictate certain out, um, not dictate again, I shouldn't use that. They, they can influence certain outcomes. I'll just give you an example. The Taliban, the members of the Taliban who are part of the negotiating team now in Doha, they live in Pakistan right now, almost all of them. They have businesses there. A lot of their families are back in Pakistan. In, in, in a matter of 24 hours, when Pakistan decided to freeze assets of Mullah Baradar and, and, and Saraj, Saraj Haqqani, they actually froze their assets, but then within 24 hours, they unfroze uh, their assets uh, and then provided them a, a protocol that was equal to a, a government. Um, and, and they can, um, uh, the, and there's so many ways in which in which uh, uh, the, the Taliban um, will be very much open to, um, to the influence of, of, of Pakistani um, establishment that, that's in contact with them. Um, so, so I think for many, many years, the whole um, I, I, I notion of the fact that nobody can dictate terms to anybody, especially when, when you're talking about a radical Islamic group, that misses the point because they are not going to ask them to do something that goes against their values. It's only, um, it's only on in, in relation to questions that completely have nothing to do with values that Pakistan is in a position to uh, to direct action. Maybe I should have used the term goals rather than values. One of those goals being in a, perhaps an Islamic Emirates. Let me let me follow on with this right now. I think we agree that Pakistan did play a cooperative role here in the Taliban showing up in Doha. They may have wanted to go there anyway, but it didn't take much convincing for their own reasons. Um, right now, those talks, if we look at the stretch back to February 29th, when an agreement was signed with the US, they've really not made much progress. And so the pro prognosis for them uh, at this point, probably we would all agree, is not very good. Uh, it's, not in, it's not impossible that they will reach agreement down the line here. But let me ask this. What would a failure of those talks, if they broke down or if they clearly were bogged down, uh, what, would, what would this mean for, for Pakistan? Uh, Who'd like, who'd like to tackle that? Afrizal. Well, uh, Taliban representatives have publicly stated in Doha that they have a plan B. 
and the plan B is a sort of a military uh, victory. And from the last uh, many months, they are regrouping in our uh, districts very close to different line. Thousands of them have gathered in uh, the newly merged districts of Portunhua. And uh, uh, you see these districts, although technically they are merged in our province, uh, but they actually remain under military control. They are practically under martial law. Military policing, military control over these districts is very strong. And uh, you see there, there is a legal limbo in these districts. It's called, uh, there's a regulation action in aid of civil power, which uh, empowers military to arrest, to keep prisoners and to uh, c control the area. So, so this is uh, all in preparation of this plan B. And, uh, the, uh, and you see, uh, for Pakistani uh, handlers of Taliban, the ideal situation would be uh, what was in the 90s. You see, micromanaging, uh, you see, if there is a recognized state authority, of course, that state authority, whoever of the, the government, I mean, I'm not talking of the government, the state, uh, you see, the, you, you will have to give priority to that state because of it, its international stature and recognition. But you see, if they are uh, sort of uh, warlords, different groups, then you can call them or you, you can just create coalitions, you can play chess uh, more, more easily. So, so I, I, I think they, they, unfortunately, it's a very, very uh, disturbing situation. And when I look at history, the only time that such, such confrontation and animosity uh, and zero-sum game was played was in 19th century, when in 1820s and 1830s, I mean, the, the, the uh, Punjab uh, government, uh, 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 monarchy, a kingdom of Ranjit Singh, had very bad relations with Durrani Afghanistan. And it, it, it was bad for both of them. They clashed, and both of them got weakened, and ultimately Britishers captured both of them. So, so you see, this is very, very unfortunate, but this is uh, a policy. And, and you see, our, our, our generals are capable of these policies. You see, 1971, what happened to Pakistan? Uh, so, so you see, it, it, they, they, may, they might have the best of in, intentions, but, but, but you see, when it comes to politics, their capacity in making political decisions, they may be very good military leaders, but when it comes to policy decisions, you see, in, in 1870, when we, our, our country got disintegrated because of this, this uh, policy which entered a blind alley. And, and you see, uh, the, the Mujahideen groups, we remember, Pakistani uh, handlers of Taliban create very good military machines but not very good political parties. You see, uh, Mujahideen groups, uh, the mess that they created when they entered Kabul. Uh, and similarly, Taliban in, in the previous uh, uh, incarnation. Uh, so uh, I, I really, uh, as long as in Pakistan, there is, there, there is some change, I mean, democratic change, which the Pakistani opposition parties are aiming at. And I have great hopes from that because uh, it's like 72 when Zulfikar Ali Bhutto took over Pakistan political government. There's a hope that Mr. Nawaz Sharif, three times prime minister from Punjab, with great influence in Punjab, is backing very clear demands. And he wants, he wants to do away with the state above the state, which, which is the, definitely the GHQ. And, and if he can do that, the whole country will unite behind him. And, and, and it is there where, where we can have a fresh Afghan policy of have befriending Afghan state and Afghan society is a good day bring a brotherly country rather than uh, playing these uh, Cold War games, fighting wars of attrition, etc, etc. Okay. Uh, yes, I said. I don't remember if ever negotiations alone on the table brought about a conclusion or a result. It's your strength on ground, which includes military strength primarily especially in Afghanistan, if that is taken into account, then the Taliban's position on the table is so strong, they've defied the world's mightiest alliance. On the other hand, we have certain factions sitting in Doha who, despite the support from the rest of the world, could not stand on their own. Now, this is the type of differential that we have in the two parties to expect that here, the strength, the inherent strength will not count towards a final solution, that is being very disingenuous. Now, that is, if that is going to be the hard reality, and we can be wishful for anyone's success, 
I do believe that like Gustav Zafratik said something about the plan B, the plan B, at least the plan B in B, will determine in what direction these negotiations will go. If they do not succeed on table, yes, of course, the military might on the ground will decide. You do not like it, but that's what happens. And that is where, that is where Pakistan always wanted to position itself to the side where not only that they have the wherewithal of getting rid of the foreigners, but also ultimately being in a position to bring about that grand consensus that I'm talking about. Rama Shah Abdali did not, you know, hold a jerga to bring about Afghanistan. It was because of the certain strength that he had on ground, the tribal strength. Thank you. Yes, Abhati, did you have your hand up? And then, and then, and then Jab. Sure. Um, so, you know, when I think about what the failure of the Afghan peace process would mean for Pakistan, it's, you know, what are the options? And some of this has been alluded to already, but uh, what happens next? Uh, is uh, the, the I, I think the, you know, is America going to continue to stay? Uh, and I think uh, the answer might be that America's presence gets prolonged a little bit, especially with a Biden administration, which will not pull out recklessly, you know, which will insist on a responsible withdrawal. But I don't think that America will get pulled into significantly increasing its presence. You know, Biden was always opposed to the surge, even the Obama surge. So America won't get pulled into significantly increasing its presence. It'll sort of stay at the level it currently is or, or a little bit below. So, so then what happens if the Afghan peace process is failed and America is not significantly increasing its presence? Uh, you know, I think, I think many people would say that Afghanistan will either go into a state of civil war and then given the Taliban's military might um, that you know, you'll see the Taliban ascending uh, to, to a certain position. And what in turn does that imply for Pakistan, right? So, you know, what does uh, civil war imply for Pakistan? Nothing good, right? Uh, because Pakistan, uh, that will spill over into Pakistan. And what does an ascendant Taliban imply for Pakistan? Uh, you know, even those uh, sort of um, uh, the, the, the spillovers from that are, are, as I said, problematic because that really depends on Pakistan, uh, on the Afghan Taliban's relationship with the Tehrike Taliban Pakistan. It really depends on how it exports militant fundamentalism to Pakistan's border. And Pakistan has already been seeing the, the Pakistan Taliban, the Tehrike Taliban Pakistan regrouping in the areas that it formerly controlled. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, pa the Pakistani military is being attacked by the TTP. Uh, and and um, dozens of Pakistani soldiers have died over this last year, much more than in the, in the, the previous couple of years. So those those are all matters of concern to Pakistan. And one, one final thing, if we think about Pakistan's relationship with America, that, as I said, you know, will depend, that depends on uh, sort of the, the you know, what happens in Afghanistan, because Afghanistan has really defined Pakistan's relationship with America. And if the peace process fails, in some ways, Pakistan's usefulness to America uh, sort of may wash away because that peace process has been instrumental to improving the US-Pakistan relationship in the last couple of years. So, you know, it raises real questions about the future of the US-Pakistan relationship as well if this, this peace process fails. Thank you. Javid. Uh, well, first of all, I, the peace process does not have to fail. Uh, it would be um, it would be a, a miss, and it would be a shame, uh, really, if if um, at this stage, um, on uh, it was on anybody's mind uh, a serious possibility and an acceptable scenario that that this could fail, and that anyone could live with it, because um, because the, the the consequences uh, from where I see it is is going to be catastrophic, and I'm going to come in a, in, in a moment to, uh, to comment about that, but. But but the peace process uh, can succeed. Um, but precisely, uh, what is required is to take that Plan B off the table uh, that that uh, Afrasiab said. Uh, that has to be off the table. I think there has to be a realization. I think to 
in the same degree that 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 the um, that the representatives of the Islamic Republic um, here um, from um, that they are convinced that the peace process is the only way forward. Uh, the Taliban should have the same um, clarity of mind about this. Um, and one of the things that, that Pakistan could do um, to, uh, to help in this regard is, is to really make um, um, its, its, its role, its, its support for the peace process um, Afghan focused. Um, the peace process, and, and we all know this, I don't have to say a great deal, the, currently, Pakistan's role is essentially out of a, a deal with the United States. Um, it has an understanding with the United States. Um, I don't know what, it's, what, is, uh, what is it that it's getting back in return from the US, but it really was an, uh, something that was built um, by um, negotiated at one level by Ambassador Khalilzad, but obviously at a higher level, uh, uh, there was a, an understanding, bilateral understanding between the US and Pakistan, which brought about Pakistan's support for the, for the peace process. I say this because I personally um, was, was part of efforts uh, several times in the past, many years ago, where we wanted to really um, earnestly engage Pakistan in support of a, some sort of a, a negotiation process with the Taliban, but it did not materialize. So Pakistan still it, um, is not prepared to deliver um, Taliban to a negotiating table out of a consideration for its Afghan neighbors. I think they have done that out of a consideration for its relationship with the United States, but that's fine as far as we are concerned. We need, we, we want the apple, um, as they say. Uh, we don't uh, mind whether it's from another a fig tree. Uh, what, what I would say is that if that, um, uh, in God forbid, if it comes to that, that for various other reasons, the peace process fails, I would say the, um, I, I don't think we're going to go back uh, to status quo ante. I think um, I think the possible e even civil war is really um, again another mistake that we repeatedly make a lot of us in these discussions. It's not going to be civil war that Afghanistan is going to go to. It's going to be um, a regional proxy war. Um, Pakistan is not the only country that has influence um, in Afghanistan and, and that that it can count on in the in the in the foreseeable in in the potential scenario where it breaks down um, there are other countries that have uh, that have uh, 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 equal amount of strategic interests and they are not going to sit down this time they are not going to allow pakistan to come and take over like they did in the 90s so so i think i think the prospect of of a totally disastrous a catastrophic regional proxy water and and all all out war is 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 really um, conceivable so i think that's really something that, that that we all must get our act uh, together and that's for that very reason that i cannot even um, bring myself to admit that the peace process um, should, can can fail uh, i said yes i agree pakistan is not the only country i agree with pakistan's role sometimes gets overrated and that's the reason for the last 10 years, Pakistan has been positioning itself. It's our initiative, which brought Iran on board, improved our relations with Russia. China was already there, Turkey joined us. Now these are the countries that have positioned themselves to be able to manage post US Afghanistan, as best as it, it does not have to fail, but it may. And if it does, of course, there will be civil war. And then what would say, whatever is the implication, of course, yes, indeed, there will be implication for us. But no one needs to threaten us that because of that, our relations with the United States would get affected. If it's a relationship that entirely depends on how we do in Afghanistan or how we don't, then it is not a relationship worth nurturing. This relationship can be shoved anywhere. And the last point, you know, the Madhya talking about TTP. TTP is uh, the byproduct of the Soviet, of the American uh, occupation of Afghanistan. We will take care of it in our own way. It was 
to start with, it was one group that rose because of our support for the United States. In the meantime, there were 40 groups. We took care of some of them. The others will also be in due course. Now they're hiding somewhere. When they come, we will see. That is our job. And no one has to really uh, either um, empathize or sympathize or try and throw that argument at us. But the main thing still remains. What is it that Pakistan at this time can do to support the peace process? I suppose one has done. Beyond that, one may not be able to do. There is no guarantee that it will succeed. And if it does not, one with the, people, the countries in the region would be prepared to face the fallout. That's inevitable. That's always been so. So there is no such thing, you know, as the, the silver bullet that will inflict the Afghan issue. I would argue that uh, the, the notion that we will take care of the TTP in our own way um, is, a, is a very problematic one. That is the notion um, that was used in uh, the 2007 timeframe onwards, after which the TTP did kill um, tens of thousands of Pakistanis, including military and security forces, uh, including, uh, you know, government, uh, targeting government officials. And the and, and militant groups and terrorist groups cannot really be taken care of only by kinetic action because they derive their roots uh, from a structure uh, that feeds into them. And that is a structure of extremism. And as I've written in my book, that structure of extremism um, is um, something that comes directly from the, the actions of the Pakistani state partly intended, of course, partly unintended through its education system, through its laws, through its politics. Um, and that is something that is that is uh, that that Pakistan will ultimately need to deal with. You know, Afrasiab talked about the National Action Plan. The National Action Plan was one part of what Pakistan needed to deal with, and it did not. Uh, but this is far broader than the National Action Plan. This has to do with the very structure of how Pakistani citizens perceive themselves and the world that leads into the roots of extremism that need to be dealt with for Pakistan's own sake, not for anybody else's sake, but for Pakistan's own sake. Okay. Um, you know, I think we're all in agreement that the nightmare for Afghanistan is something akin to that period between 1992 and 1996. And that, and Joe would make reference to the of a chaotic civil war and this presumably this would be a much more chaotic there are many more st stock uh, holders of uh, of uh, of stock in this in this outcome than there were before uh, that's but it, it certainly has to be factored in here and maybe it's as you say it serves as a warning here for why we can't let Failure happened, but failure can happen. Uh, we 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 are aware of this. Uh, so let me just very quickly quickly go around and say, can Pakistan live with an Islamic emirate? That is, can it go back to nineteen uh, before two thousand and one? Uh, is this something that Pakistan? because Pakistan is a different country too. It didn't have an extremist threat of its own in the 1990s. Uh, so it obviously has to look at Afghanistan somewhat differently than it did then. Uh, so quickly then, because we oh, I do want to get to some questions. Uh, well, <clears throat> is Pakistan thinking about it all uh, about what will happen if whether through diplomacy or through military means or both, there is an opportunity for the Taliban to either be in a position of, uh, of, uh, of ascendancy or to have simply have monopolized consolidated power. Thoughts on this quickly. Oh God, Emirates, the Islamic Emirates if it comes into me, it's against the Afghan ethos. But as far as the resistance goes on, the war goes on, the mullah, the ideologists, they do play a role. 
once it's over, and that's the history of our tribal lineage, that's the history of Afghanistan. After that, the others take over. The peace is not led by the militants. The militants led by the mullahs only do the resistance part. My thesis, and that's an old one, the day if the Taliban did succeed in 94, 95, 96 to take over Afghanistan, that would have been the end of the Taliban. Then after that, they would cease to exist as a group. Then there will be political groups. Right now also, once they do manage to bring you know, this present situation to an end, after that, it will be the Afghan way that will prevail, and not the Taliban. But just in case it happened, Pakistan will live there. After all, that is their decision. If they have an Islamic Emirate, like the Iran, you know, came to a particular uh, regime, it did not spill over the borders. In fact, the Afghans, the Taliban used to, or the Mujahideen used to blame us that because of your mother's uh, people are getting radicalized. It's one way of blaming the other, you know, because of you, this has happened. Now, the internal dynamics is the one that ultimately determines it. The rest is rationalization. Okay. Charlie, did you have any last thoughts on this? Um, I, I think, I, I think Pakistan um, shouldn't live with, um, uh, uh, I mean, because um, because I think it's going to be um, be quite um, quite dangerous, uh, uh, not just for Pakistan but for the region as a whole. When we we really think that uh, what's going on currently in Afghanistan, what what's being negotiated in Doha, is not strictly an Afghan conflict. It has always been going back decades. It's always been a regional. Um, uh, conflict has always had international and through global um, dimensions. Now, to that extent, we are the, the onus is on us Afghans to come up with some sort of a dispensation that then stabilizes Afghanistan. But but but, but we have to recognize that whatever that that dispensation is going to have have huge implications for security of the, of our neighbors. Um, which is precisely what we believe that a Republican, some sort of a, a, a democratic dispensation, go, learning from experience, as, as was said earlier, learning from experience, that's the only way to, um, to um, not only to unite people, which, uh, which Durrani Saab said earlier, the importance of, of, you know, of participation, of making sure that all Afghans are included, so it's not only just that, but it's also that's the only way to assure people, not just Pakistan, let's also remember that Central Asians are, are much more worried um, than Pakistan is. Um, I'm sure others um, be, uh, in, in the wider region are, are, are worried even more. So, so, so if um, an Islamic Republic comes, that would obviously come uh, essentially, uh, as, as a result of of, um, of the collapse of the current democratic uh, regime, and and that that is why I believe it's um, you know you won't be able to achieve that internal cohesion, that sort of inclusive uh, governance that uh, that we require, as was said earlier. But that's also something that we that cannot and. Uh, I, I have no way to, to you know, uh, uh, that that uh, to, to to imagine that we would be able to convince our northern neighbors, let alone uh, others, that that would be not a threat to them. Okay, uh, I'm glad you ended with this, but quickly, Medea, and ask for if you have something to say. Go ahead. I think just very quickly, I, the the victory a victory for the Taliban and the establishment of an Islamic Emirate would be seen as a boon to all jihadist groups in the region. Um, you know, whether it be the 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 Lashkar -e Taibas and so on, because that's a it's a, it's a victory for jihadism. And I I think we should we shouldn't um, understate that fact. And I think 
in general, you know, Afghanistan, Iran is very different relative to Afghanistan in its importance and closeness to Pakistan. So, you know, depending on what an Islamic Emirate means for Afghanistan, does it mean women are not going to work? Does it mean girls are not going to school? Does it mean vice and virtue squads? Um, you know, is it a return to the 90s or is it a different kind of Islamic Emirate as the Taliban has, of course, been insisting over the last uh, couple of years. Um, but if it is the latter, if it is all those things that we worry about, you know, it is hard to think that across the border that people will not observe that and political groups will not observe that. You know, Pakistan had the MMA uh, from 2002 to 2008 um, in power in parliament, which tried to do a bunch of things in the in the Northwest Frontier Province then as, uh, you know, Afra Siyab, I'm sure, can tell us much more about. Um, so, so vice and virtue squads, et cetera, you know, the, the future of women, that is a concern across the border as well if an Islamic Emirate insists on on taking actions like it did in the 1990s. We've had a number of questions about uh, American policy and actually, uh, the DI, you have responded to those about what we might speculate would be Biden's policy. So uh, I'm not going to pursue that, but uh, some of the questions have talked about the region and that just came up here. Uh, does the region at this point is it part of the solution? Uh, or are they uh, just to be recognized as necessary for cooperation if there is an agreement that you can't, can't work without the region? But can they play a role here? China, uh, Russia, uh, uh, Iran, as well as Pakistan, and Saudi Arabia for that matter. Uh, are, 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 are they actors in this in any important way, aside from the fact that they would probably all like to see a peaceful solution? Uh, so thoughts on this? That's, that takes on a couple of the questions. Yes. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, Jemmy. Okay. Um, well, absolutely. Um, the region is integral uh, to, to the solution. Uh, not, not just for the reason that I mentioned earlier, but the fact that, that this, the conflict that we're talking about is essentially um, a, a, regional, uh, a, a, a regional conflict. Uh, but also because I think um, we're, we're, um, the, uh, not only in, the, uh, uh, in terms of the process of, of the peace talks right now, uh, where without the help of the region, it would not have been possible to come to this point, and it would certainly not be possible to move from here to some sort of a peace settlement uh, with the Taliban. Um, this is only one side of the story, but uh, the more important um, uh, sort of role for the region that I see is, is in, a, in a potential end state uh, for, for, the peace, uh, for the peace talks. I cannot imagine any peace uh, agreement uh, between uh, us and the Taliban uh, uh, translating into, in, into real durable peace uh, without a regional buy-in into that and without a regional um, guarantee or some sort of um, a really in, in a binding commitment from the region to, to, um, uh, to ensure that that, uh, uh, that, uh, that, that holds that, that peace which is why I am actually very surprised that um, there isn't a parallel uh, process of consensus building across the region towards that kind of, um, of an end state. Um, I, I think on the day when the agreement uh, or a agreement is finally reached between the Taliban and, and the Afghan government, on that day, if there isn't a, a parallel um, consensus uh, from the region that says that, that, that the region is committed, recognizes this agreement, this peace as um, the outcome that they all find desirable and they all um, are committed to support, in that these are the final binding commitments that the region agrees to make. Without that, that, that peace agreement for me would be meaningless. Anyone else? Yes, Arsene. See, if everyone believes that region is important, who am I going? to say that it will not matter. After all, we are part of the region. It can play its role. But essentially, it's what Afghanistan is. 
the division that they exist. I've talked about some of them. But there is one division that actually ultimately scuttles so many of these processes. Almost in history, whenever it has been invaded from outside, some have cooperated, the others have resisted. So that resistors and the collaborators, that type of a division is very difficult to overcome. Ultimately, the resistors succeed. And for them, the collaborators were the traitors, the impedators. So they have to come. Oh, that, that, that has to be taken care of. And the last point is, we need not give the bad dog a bad name before shooting. What's wrong with jihadism? First class, I think because without jihadism, the Afghans probably would never have done whatever they have achieved. Defeated superpowers one after the other. And jihadism in a sense is actually to standing up for what you believe is good and fight for it. And that is what I suppose ultimately determines what shape a particular uh, region, what place particular people take. So jihad need not be run down just because jihad seems to be a bad day nowadays for the last about two decades. Any closing thoughts? And I'll get to you in a moment. Afra uh, Sahab, any closing thoughts that you have here? Yes, I think uh, uh, in, pa in Pakistan, we have to have a shift, paradigm shift uh, in our Afghan policy. And United States also has to revisit this Doha uh, perimeter framework of the negotiations, because that, that was too narrow for peace and reconciliation in Afghanistan. And uh, those who think that uh, Afghans who fought against superpowers will uh, sort of uh, accept Pakistani hegemony, I think that, that is not realistic. I, I, I think Afghans will definitely rise against it. And I, I have great hopes of Pakistani democracy, democratic movements in Pakistan. And uh, I also want to underline that the Taliban have been killing not only Afghans, but Pashtuns in Pakistan. 1,000 members of the party that I was working in were killed by Taliban. And when we talk of 60,000 people killed in Pakistan, if you go for the breakup uh, of the provinces or uh, ethnicities, uh, more than 90% of them were Pashtuns, even on the east of the Devran line. So, so, so 50 million Pashtuns in Pakistan obviously uh, are, are not, cannot be indifferent to the situation uh, which is emerging. So, uh, so I, I, I have great hopes in people in Afghanistan, people in Pakistan, and peace and democracy uh, bo both of them uh, need each other. And I think the generals have to go back as, as uh, Pakistani opposition parties are saying. Thank you. To the back. And, and will you close us off here? We, we have run to our, our limits as far as time is concerned. I'm sure we have lots more to speak about if we had more time. And I, and I also want to mention that uh, uh, naturally there are many more questions than uh, could be uh, uh, tackled by this panel. Uh, Many of them were excellent. Uh, so thank you for submitting those questions. Medea, please. Sure. Um, uh, so just very quickly, I think Afra Siab said it, uh, said it well, you know, jihadism is a real problem for the citizens of both those countries, for Afghans who are dying, for Pakistanis who have died at the hands of it. So, um, so, so, so that is the, the, the problem with it. Uh, uh, and and um, on, I think what is really interesting and important to watch going forward uh, in, in the US is what approach Biden takes, uh, you know, to a responsible withdrawal and how he helps along with the peace process. Does he keep Khalilzad on the team or not? Um, I think we should watch. But I also think what Trump does in the remaining couple, uh, the remaining few weeks that he has, where you know people are worried that he is going to try to withdraw all troops before he leaves office, um, uh, given the actions he's taking with the Defense Department. You know, we'll have to watch and see, and that will have real repercussions for the region. But I think I'll leave on a very hopeful note in terms of Pakistan. I do think that Pakistan is coming to realize that you know, its approach should be an approach that is an economic centered one. And that for that, a stable Afghanistan is the key. And, and, and we, should pin, uh, we should pin some positive hopes on that. And would you also, I'm sure you all would, that a stable Pakistan is also a necessary ingredient in this 
uh, most certainly definitely. a Pakistan which is in turmoil uh, for whatever reason internally or because of external forces uh, would not serve really the cause of peace uh, in the region or obviously uh, in, in Pakistan itself. Uh, I want to thank again the those who have watched with us uh, this fascinating panel, thank the participants who have uh, uh, ranging from uh, uh, Islamabad to Kabul to Peshawar, I assume, uh, and, and here in Washington joining us. Uh, it's great to have you and uh, uh, all the best. Keep well, keep safe, keep healthy. <laughs>